I'm Lisa. And I'm Mike. I'm just wondering, who was your favorite teacher at any time in school? Ooh, uh, I would have to go with my high school history teacher, Mr. Nargang. He treated me and the other students like we were friends, which made our classroom environment really fun, and he inspired me to study history. Well, that's awesome, and I'm sure you did really well in his class because of that experience. Yeah. And isn't it amazing that when we connect with somebody, we learn a whole lot better from them? Yeah, so our big idea today is that Jesus invited others to learn from him. And now we're gonna look at a story where he had to accommodate a huge group of people to try and teach them when he didn't have the internet or a big screen or a chalkboard or anything to help him out. Let's watch. What do you call a bear with no teeth? A gummy bear. Hi, I'm Michaela. When I was a camper at a camp, one of the activities you could do was windsurfing. Do you know what windsurfing is? You've got this big board and a sail sort of attached at the middle. And so you have to stand up on your board and pull up your sail and sort of maneuver the sail around to catch the wind. So I learned windsurfing and I was so excited to do it that when I became a counselor, I started teaching other people how to do it as well. And that reminds me of today's big idea that Jesus invited others to learn from him. See, Jesus didn't just have this way and connection with God and keep it for himself. In fact, he had a desire to share it with as many people as he could. It's like when you learn something new for the first time. You're so excited about it that you wanna share it with as many people as you can. So today we are going to jump into Luke chapter five, verse one to 11. So Jesus had just healed a bunch of people and people were starting to realize that he was more than just a teacher. Let's see what it says in the Bible. One day, Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee. The people crowded around him and listened to the word of God. Let's just take a minute to imagine that. So Jesus is standing at the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is actually a freshwater lake. So you've got the wind swirling and you've got Jesus standing there. And so there's a whole big crowd around him and it's just Jesus' voice. There's no microphones or large speakers, so the crowd is coming in and around him. Let's read what happens next. Jesus saw two boats at the edge of the water. They had been left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into the boat that belonged to Simon. Jesus asked him to go out a little way from shore. Then he sat down in the boat and taught the people. So Jesus was in the boat and he was teaching people. See, Jesus loved teaching as many people as he could. It's kind of cool to imagine that the boat was Jesus' stage. When he finished speaking, he turned to Simon. He said, go out into deep water, let the nets down so you can catch some fish. Simon answered, master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught a large number of fish. There were so many that their nets began to break. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. After teaching the people, Jesus wanted to thank Simon by getting him more fish and showing them who he really was. So he told Simon to cast down his nets. But Simon was like, Jesus, we've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything. But because you're asking, I will do as you say. So when he threw over the nets, there were so many fish that the nets began to break. He had to call over his partners to help catch the fish, but their boats began to sink. That's so cool. Let's see what happens next. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. Go away from me, Lord, he said. I am a sinful man. He and everyone with him were amazed at the number of fish they had caught. So were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who worked with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch people. Jesus was inviting Simon, James, and John to come with him and fish for people. I know that sounds really crazy, but it basically means that they would join, follow, and be with Jesus. It also means that they would go out and share the news with as many people as they could. So what did the men do? Let's read. So they pulled their boats up on shore. Then they left everything and followed him. In order to follow Jesus, these men left everything they'd ever known behind. They didn't complain or try to compromise, but they immediately dropped their stuff. They went with Jesus to learn how to live, love, and serve like him. And that is why Jesus invited others to learn from him. 
Looking back on my story, when I learned how to windsurf, I was so excited and passionate about it that I wanted to teach as many people as I could. See, when we learn from Jesus, we go out and we want to teach as many people as we can. Well, that's it for me. It's been so great spending time with you. I'm Michaela, and I'll see you again. Quickly turn to the person next to you and answer the following questions. Question time. What would you have liked to hear Jesus teach more about? Why? What questions would you ask him if he were here right now? How cool was that? Mm -hmm. Jesus taught that large crowd. They clearly connected with him because they stayed to learn more. And then a bunch of guys got a real practical lesson on who Jesus is by catching a whole bunch of fish more than they could even handle. Yeah, and I so appreciate that he didn't just tell them the information, he gave them a hands-on practical experience, which for me is so much more helpful than just hearing something. If I can touch it and see it, that helps me a ton. Well, then you are going to love this next video, okay. but I'm not gonna give you any more clues. Watch how quickly you can figure this out. I'm John, I'm 16, and I'm a speed cuber, which means I solve Rubik's Cubes in official competitions all over the world. I've always been into robotics, and one day I saw a video of a robot solving a Rubik's Cube, and I was like, whoa, that's sick. So I decided that I would try to make a robot to solve the Rubik's Cube, because I was like, oh man, I'll never be able to solve that, but a robot can. But my robot didn't work, so then I had a mixed up Rubik's Cube on my desk, so I went online, found some instructions, and after about a week, I was able to solve the cube in a minute and a half. After that, I saw videos of like the world records and there's people solving the cube in five or six seconds. And I kind of wanted to get there one day because I'm somewhat of a competitive person. So I, I started learning more tricks and my time slowly went down, you know, a minute, 30 seconds. And then after six months, I discovered there's competitions for this. So I kind of wanted to go and see how good I was. After going to a few competitions, I really wanted to make it onto the podium because I thought I was at that level already. And there were multiple competitions in a row where I kept placing fourth, fourth, fourth many times. And one day I sort of broke through the glass ceiling and I got on the podium in the 4x4 event. I came third place. Uh, so that was really fulfilling for me. And I've continued to get on the podium ever since. And right now I'm sort of gearing up for the World Championships, which are next summer and I would like to definitely place there. When I solve the Rubik's Cube behind my back or blindfolded, how it works is I've assigned each piece on the Rubik's Cube a letter, so A, B, C, D, and then I would take the different letters and string them together. For example, if I had J, S, A, D, it would be Jesus after death, and then I would just create a really crazy story in my head which makes it easier to remember. The crazier the story, the longer I can remember it. And then those letters are the information I need to know. I need to solve this piece, this piece, and then I go through and eventually the Rubik's Cube is solved. All right, so the first thing we're trying to do, we want to get one layer, and this is the first step to solving the Rubik's Cube, and it's a big stepping stone. So. I like to inspire younger kids to solve the Rubik's Cube or preteens because um, I think it's something really cool that everyone should get into. Uh, I share online through email and text with a couple of kids I know, but I think the biggest place I do it is at Urban Promise and they're an organization that works with inner city youth in Toronto. I think when a lot of kids see me do the Rubik's Cube, they say, whoa, that's so cool, but at the same time, they're like, 
oh man, that must be impossible. I'll never be able to do that. But after I sit down with them for a while, they see it isn't the most difficult thing in the world and everyone can really do it. And solving the Rubik's Cube is something everyone should strive for. So I think with the Rubik's Cube, you'll never really find two people who are at the same stage. And that's the same way with a faith journey. You'll never find two people who are exactly at the same place. And I think that even someone who looks like they have it all figured out, whether that's with the Rubik's Cube or with God, there's always more to learn for those people. And they can even learn from someone who might look like they have less experience than them. And everyone can sort of teach each other and journey together. Question time. What's something you're passionate about that you can teach others? What's something about Jesus you'd want others to know? Okay, I don't know what I'm doing. Clearly, I'm not John. That guy was fast and so talented. He could do it behind his back, blindfolded. I'm, I'm at a loss for words, <laughs> yeah, literally. I thought you'd like that video. And what I love about John is that he's just an ordinary, down-to-earth teenager who loves to share his knowledge with other people and clearly has a heart for Jesus. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm going to have to keep watching that video so I can try and figure this thing out. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Now, why don't we break up into our small groups to find out how we can apply what we've learned into our own lives.